Carl Spadoni is the Director of Archives and Research Collections at the McMaster University Library in Hamilton, Ontario, and also the co-compiler uh, of, co-author? Of the uh, bibliography of McClellan and Stewart imprints with Judy Donnelly. Judy Donnelly, great. Yeah. Okay, welcome to the bibliophile. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to start with just a brief history of McClelland and Stewart, how it started, when? McClelland and Stewart has its uh, roots in uh, religious publishing, in the Methodist Book and Publishing House, because the early partners, McClelland and Goodchild, were hired there, and they started their own firm in 1906, although in the early years it was more of an importer, importer of books. Kind of an agent? Uh, for yeah, an yeah. agency. The first book comes out in 1909. They really don't publish books in Canada in the sense of printing them and editing and all that. That comes a few years later. So with the first book you say, 1909, yes. what, what does that mean? that they? 1909 uh, are their first imprints. See, it's McClellan and Goodchild from 1906 to 1915. McClellan, Goodchild and Stewart, when Stewart joins the firm, roughly 1914 to the end of the war, 1919, when Goodchild leaves and F.D. Goodchild sets, Frederick Goodchild sets up his own company. He, he dies about 1923. And in the early years, when it's McClelland and Goodchild, just the two of them, it's mainly uh, an agency business, to a certain extent stationary, and they're developing a little bit of their own line of books. They do put out some catalogs, although by 1909, certain imprints come out with their title page. In point of fact, they are doing little actual publishing until the, really the First World War. 1909, for example, books would have been printed in, in England, let's England say. England or America. The first book that allegedly was uh, published by them is this John D. Rockefeller's Random Reminiscences of Men and Events. Four other imprints come out in that particular year. 1910, they, they've got an edition, they had several editions of Norman Angel's Extraordinary Book provocative book in which he prefigures the First World War and, and predicts all sorts of terrible things are going to happen. What's that one called? The Great Illusion. The Great Illusion. Yeah, okay. a study of the relation of military power of nations. So that would have been published or printed? In England by Heinemann. This, this particular book was an absolute bestseller. It was published by Angel himself. Angel wins the Nobel Prize, by the way, in 1933. He tried to form the Neutrality League and stop the First World War. In reconstructing this bibliography, we did not have the actual imprints here. We reconstructed it. We did go to certain sources such as Bookseller and Stationer. That is, Bookseller and Stationer is the Canadian, it's the equivalent of Quill and Choir for the teens and the start of the 20th century. The, the trade journal. Yeah, but we yeah. also searched all sorts of catalogs and other things. Point of fact, we haven't covered, although we did this bibliography. They're never finished, are they? Well, new imprints have, have come on the market, and, and moreover, print runs with regard to some of these imprints. I mean, how many copies exist? Or how, how many did they did they put out? 50, 100? We still have uh, obtained books with, just a little while ago, I obtained five or six. They pop up all the time. A lot of times, with regard to our own work, we have an imprints not located section, and it's rather large, and it's mainly the imprints of the company prior to 1920, and that's based on information, as I said, from Bookseller and Stationer, because the Bookseller and Stationer actually says what was published in a particular year. You don't actually have the physical book? Bookseller and Stationers under McClelland and Stewart has a complete list for a particular year of books that come out. Right. The problem is, did they actually publish the book or did they import the book? Okay. Right? And if they imported the book and acted as, as the book's agent, it might not necessarily have had the book's imprint. Right. So this is the sort of early part of the company. Their first really big book, one can debate this, but I think it's L.M. Montgomery's the Watchman and other poems. When L. M. Montgomery has uh, problems with her own publisher in Boston, that's Page, and L. C. Page. Yeah. When she has problems and there's a lawsuit and everything, uh, John McCullen, in fact, becomes her agent, and then her books, from then on, are pretty well published. Not necessarily always published in Canada, but. Certainly McClellan and Stewart is taking care of her, or at that time McClellan, Goodchild, and Stewart, because that's the first imprint. Okay. It's a book of poems. What year was that? That was 1916. Uh, I've seen that book in Dust Jacket, and it's a very scarce book. The American publication also, very, very scarce book. Who knows how many copies of that, but the, the very fact that they took over the publication of L.M. Montgomery, mm -hmm. I mean, they were also publishing a number of other Canadian authors at this particular time. They get very much interested in war publication, but they also start turning towards 
Canadian literature, really their turn towards Canadian literature is only in the 20s. And then they really do go at it, but then there's a doldrum in the 30s and the 40s, and then of course the company really comes alive when Jack McClelland assumes control of the company. Back from the Second World War, his story is of course uh, always interesting. Uh, his father's still running the company. Again, they're not publishing that much in the late 40s. They're still agents, basically, Basically, right? they're publishing some Canadian materials. The turning point in the company, it seems to me, is really is 1957, with the publication of the, of the New Canadian Library, and then the extraordinary another significant event occurs in 1963. That's when he disposes of all these American publishers. Also in 63, they do two other paperback series, the Carleton Library, which is the history equivalent of the NCL. Of the literature, yeah. Yeah, and in that particular year he publishes Margaret Lawrence, he's doing Burton, he's doing Peter Newman. It's quite an extraordinary year of publishing. Mm. And then it all leads up to Confederation when the company is really flagship, the big time company for Canada. It's, it's championing uh, Canadian literature the whole time. Uh, all sorts of uh, major authors that they're publishing, uh, Mordecai Richler, uh, I mentioned Margaret Lawrence. Uh, you Margaret know, Atwood. Sure. Edible Woman, I think, comes around. That's 1968. McClellan has a very up and down period after that. He expands the company in 67, and it's like $5 million, a big time enterprise. And then there's more expansion and other things happening in the 70s. But in point of fact, leading up to the, into the 80s, the company is in difficult times. And mm -hmm. McClellan is in hawk. Well, Canadian publishing is in dire straits as well. But by 1985, McClellan is also quite exhausted, and that's the period in which he sells the company to A.B. Bennett. Although he's sort of nominally involved in the company for another two years, he's really not, from, and he's acting as an agent. He's really out of publishing by then. Okay. So that's the sort of up to 87 period in which, in fact, the bibliography with uh, Junie Donnelly and I, after that, of course, it's the time of A.B. Bennett, Doug Gibson coming to McClelland and Stewart, and then after Doug Gibson, you have Douglas Pepper, A.B. Bennett selling, quite surprisingly, selling the company to the University of Toronto, which still owns it, owns 75% of the company. There are mm. some developments as well prior to that in paperback publishing with Bantam and Seal. And McClelland and Stewart, even in the last decade or so, they took, take over a number of other companies, such as Tundra Books, uh, Children Publisher, they take in McFarlane and Ross, I think, in 2002. And they do have a whole line of authors. And, and they're still doing the oh yeah. uh, New Canadian Library. Sure. Staines uh, takes over as editor, I think, in 88. Malcolm Ross is the editor. The New Canadian Library goes through several manifestations as well under Ross, and then a complete transformation under Staines. The company is, is still, of course, producing lots of books, and they've had many people and many extraordinary editors. Anna Porter and I'm... Talented. Uh, talented editors talented illustrators. They do publishing in, in many, many areas. Even now, they're, st they're still importing books. And I'm speaking with Carl Spadoni, who is the Director of Archives and Research Collections at uh, McMaster University Library and also an expert on uh, McClellan Stewart. Perhaps we could go back then to, and if you could think over uh, some of these highlights, from the perspective of a collector who's interested in this publishing house, what would you recommend that they do? Well, it depends on what the collector's interests are, but if you're collecting the imprints of the company, and we're talking about several thousand, okay. I mean, and goodness knows from 87, they probably publish 100 books a year. Uh, Jack McClellan's heyday, they did, they did at least that. What do you think would be fun to collect within this uh, publisher's output? Several things. One. Any book prior to 1920 that appears in Dust Jacket is an automatic buy. Because any books prior to 1920 with a Dust Jacket, goodness knows how many exist. That's just an automatic buy. It doesn't even matter what it is. Any book prior to 1914 is a very good buy because not very many imprints uh, exist at all. Then, of course, there are highlights in that area. I mentioned L.M. Montgomery. Any of her books, any of her books, Although, of course, McClellan and Stewart then uh, got into a reprinting of her books. Yeah. The first editions of Ellen Montgomery, definitely, they're all worth acquiring. How available are they? Do you know? They are available. It's difficult to get your hands, of course, on the ones that are in Dust Jacket. Yeah. And the prices 
go up exponentially on the dust jacket. As I they do with all books. Yeah, so. I mentioned Watchmen and Other Poems, 1916. Now, that is a scarce book in itself mm. without the jacket. But to get the book in the jacket is, is, is a very difficult find. That probably would come up every 20 years if it, if it came up a jacket at all. That's the early period. The 1920s, you get a number of books appearing under McClellan Stewart. That's the period of, of Canadiana as well, and also very nice illustrations. A number of, of, of Canadian artists are involved. For example, and what kind of illustrations? Would they be, these be woodcuts? Yeah, would they be, sure, uh, sure, absolutely. Again, in the 1920s, they're also, of course, like the early period, importing books. Ralph Connor's published in the, in the thousands and in the millions. I mean, he's the author who of, of any Canadian author prior to 1950. He's the most public published. Isn't oh, he? yeah, he's, he's absolutely huge numbers. He's yeah. all over the place. But in the 1920s, there are many other books that they do publish, and they they are often beautifully by, illustrated by Canadian illustrators. Yeah, they oh. sure are. See, but a lot of other books, they're what we call Canadian issues, right? They, yeah. they come from other places. Publishing Oppenheim and, and Woodhouse. And, but for example, take this edition of Bliss Carman's later poems. Now, in, in fact, that is a fairly common book, but it's illustrated and has decorations by J.E.H. MacDonald. And MacDonald did a number of illustrations, not just for McClelland and Stewart for this particular period, but for Ryerson as well and other publishers. So um, on the one hand, one could say, well, you know, the Carman book is you see it out there again and again, but, but still, nevertheless, it's, it's, it's kind of interesting. Well, yeah, and yeah. as you say, yeah, just yeah. in terms of both the the literary content and yeah, the fact it, that there's a, an artist, yeah. there, it's very very Canadian. But if you it? were going to do it, you'd have to do it in, in jacket. Any of these particular books in 1921, they're publishing Rilla of Ingleside, Ellen Montgomery's book. This is printed by Hunter and Rose, and also there's a an imprint, uh, perhaps a later printing by T. H. Best in Toronto. They're also publishing, for example, one of the major authors that they published throughout the years, the early years, is, is this E. Philip Oppenheim, one of these mystery writers. Yeah. Right? Hutter and Stoughton did, yeah. uh, did, yeah. did love yeah. his stuff. Yeah, but yeah. they're also publishing Arthur Stringer, although in the case of Arthur Stringer, the major publisher is Bob Merrill in the, in the States. Mm. So I would collect certain authors of the 20s. I don't... Like who? Well, I, I collect representative authors, but I co collect Canadian as opposed to others. Maybe, maybe not. Certainly, as I mentioned, L. M. Montgomery. But then, of course, the other so thing is that is the amount of money that you want to pay. Well, that's it. And the other thing is, so many people coll collect oh. Lucy Maud Montgomery. Oh, she's she's impossible. S so I really, mean, uh, the advice to a collector yeah. often is to try and go after stuff that not everyone's going after. Well, that, that, that but that may have some real value. That's true. But you know. The fact is that from the 20s to mid-50s, they're not publishing that much every year. Right. They are publishing. Um, 10 to 20 books a year, you'd say? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that, that's about it. Connor keeps on publishing with them uh, until the end of his life pretty well. Other Canadian authors, H.A. Cody, but they're also doing books, for example, by A.A. A. Milne. Certainly, anything in Dust Jacket is worth collecting in the early period of the company. When we get to the period of, of Jack McClellan, then you just some get so many books coming out. And then then it's a question of what do you collect? What do you think would make for a good collection then, but within the McClellan Stewart imprint? Well, one could collect by author. You collect Mordecai Richler and Farley Mowat and Margaret Lawrence. Uh, the list goes on and on. One could do that. You could collect uh, the poetry of the company if you wanted to. The New Canadian Library, some of those are difficult to acquire. Probably not that much money, although the booksellers are getting more savvy about that. I mean, they continue to go on, but was there a sort of a penguin? They published the first 10 in 1935. Is there a first 10 of the New Canadian yeah, there, Library? Yeah, I mean, there is. The early period of the, of the New Canadian Library, they are selecting, in point of fact, the, uh, what they consider to be major authors. So Stephen Leacock is one of the big ones. Stephen Leacock first published with McClelland and Stewart in 1930. There's a big fight between McClelland uh, Stu and Stewart and Macmillan over uh, Leacock's books. Leacock is certainly big in the New Canadian Library. Uh, they try to get a number of people, Gabriel Bois, for example. In and fact, there's an, an interesting story about how McClellan went out to yeah. St. Boniface and fell in love with her. Yeah, he did. wasn't uh, reciprocated, but yeah, I mean, he was just first married, and he that was one of his, his first uh, travels in the late 40s, and, and he always had a, a soft spot for her. But the yeah. fact of the matter is, after 1960, the number of copies that are printed of these books is in the thousands. 
So again, to focus, certainly um, Margaret Atwood's first book, Edible Woman, is a good book and jacket to have. There is a collector out there who collects uh, Governor General uh, books, and they certainly have had lots of books. They have. I collect them, too. Oh, one could do that. For the 40s and 50s, there's one area of collecting. and It's a small number of poetry books, the Indian File series. And those are quite distinctive. They're designed by Paul Arthur, and they have these sort of West Coast Indian motifs. They sort of thought of them as Canadian products. I mean, there are only nine of them. P.K. Page uh, published with them. A number of these did win the Governor General's Award for Poetry. Reaper Watson, for example, who isn't really considered to be a, a great poet. Uh, he's a geographer, poet. Time on the Lover. That's his first book, and it wins the, the Governor General's Award in uh, 1950. But it also is it's a telltale sign of how many poetry books are being published yeah. at the time. One could collect poetry, Irving Layton or Leonard Cohen, uh, although Leonard Cohen's first book is not published by McClellan and Stewart, but McGill, and that's, that's the big-time book to collect. One of the things that really attract me to Layton, other than obviously his words, are the, the covers on the swinging flesh yeah. and bowls for a one-armed juggler. These are both by Frank Newfeld. I think that would make a, a, a really fabulous collection. He probably designed four, five, six hundred. His books are eminently collectible. He did a number of poetry books. Gosh, Dennis Lee's Alligator Pie is, is not by them. I think that's published by Macmillan, but it's also published by McClellan and Stewart later on. Certainly Neufeld was involved often in the background. Uh, I don't know if his name actually appears in, in on these jackets. It does, yeah. Yeah, yeah he's, he's, he's extraordinary. He really is. Is he still alive? Yes, he is, absolutely. And he'd be, what, in his 80s? Yeah, at the uh, historical perspectives on Canadian publishing, I think there's a, a few things about Neufeld. I mean, you can collect simply for the design. You can collect for authors, or you can collect a particular period of time, mm -hmm. or a certain genre. C the company does have that sort of capacity. The fact of the matter is, at the same time, that w the later you, you collect, the more common those books are. Right. Early print runs prior to 1950, it would have been quite a astonishing if a book in Canada sold 5,000 copies. That's right? a bestseller, isn't it? Even a good seller is between one and 2,000. The works of their major authors, uh, Pierre Burton, mm -hmm. Peter Newman, Farley Mowat, the Triumvirate, uh, especially Burton, saved the company when McClelland is in dire times. He became part owner, too. Yeah, Burton. Burton. All those authors do leave the company eventually. Newman published, I think, uh, Here Be Dragons, his autobiography, with Doug Gibson. I mean, one can also collect imprints of Doug Gibson. He's had his own boutique imprint, Alice Munro, Mavis Gallant are his authors, for example. You know how, how many publishers will produce a sort of a trade edition and then they'll produce uh, a limited edition. Right. Uh, anything like that within m and Not a lot. There are. Uh, certainly in the early period, uh, I don't think so. McCollin and Stewart does get into the, the, the coffee table book in around Confederation. Some of those are major financial gambles as well that cost mm -hmm. a lot of money. There are a number of other things. I mean, they do many books in series. They do the Canadian Centenary series. They do an ethnic series. That doesn't mean to say that one should collect them. It just means that they're, 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 they're there. there. They, do a social, they do a whole Canadian social history series. They do a nature classic series. It goes on and on. Yeah. They have a whole series called the Cavendish Library series for Ellen Ellen Montgomery. That's in the 40s and the 50s. That's the, the reprints that I was talking to you oh, about. Oh, yes. And they've got very bright covers, yeah. haven't they? That's right. uh, yeah. Yellow and green. Yeah. And That's right. Obviously, the collector needs to follow their heart when it comes to collecting. Yeah. I started off by asking what you would collect. Well, from a master, we've collected. But you personally, yeah. and maybe from as, master, as we've an collected, institution. We've collected omnivorously all imprints up to 87. If I were collecting myself, then I would probably a couple of thousand dollars on Margaret Atwood right away. If you get Edible Woman, it's probably that's an expensive book, I would think. The Stone Angel, the Diviners, if you get them signed especially, those would be really good. I don't know if Leighton's going to hold his own, and moreover, what people really want to collect are those who are serious about Leighton are not the McClellan and the Stewart, but the, the contact uh, mm -hmm. books, right? Uh, again, anything pre-1920 and jacket right away. I wouldn't collect anything without the jacket. Nothing? Nothing. Okay. Nothing. 
<laughs> uh, as a collector, uh, nothing. Prior to 1914. Sure, yeah. but even some of those I wouldn't, certainly anything prior to 1912. I think the earliest jacket I've seen is 1911 or 1912. So uh, Neufeld is the one that s stands Neufeld out. Neufeld is quite nice. Anyone I, else? Well, I mentioned that particular series. Those are nice. Those are still collectible. The problem is that when you're collecting Canadian literature, out of what motive are you collecting? If yes. you're collecting for financial purposes, then that's not a good idea. <laughs> I mean, unless you were collecting L.M. Montgomery, although you wonder, well, you know, hasn't she peaked? The market is so high right now. However, I would venture to say that if you were lucky to get her early books prior to 1930 in jacket, uh, you're going to pay at least $1,000. If you were really lucky, you'd get it for $1,000. Those probably will remain, will remain. Value, if, yeah. but especially if you got them in jacket. I, I would venture to say that Watchmen and other poems is probably now at closer to five thousand than two thousand dollars in or out of jacket. In jacket. Yeah. And maybe maybe more than that. That'll never lose value. From a financial point of view, you only collect the rarest, the scarcest sort of materials. And if that's the case, there's nothing uh, by Stephen Leacock really that's really that interesting with the company. But if you're collecting from literary or some other type of point of view, then that's a different sort of thing. I am very much attracted to authors such as Margaret Lawrence. Uh, Marion Ingalls' Bear is a wonderful book. It's also published by Athenaeum in the States. Governor yeah, General's Award winner. That's the, break, that's the yeah. breakthrough for it. Finally then, I wonder if we could uh, leave McClellan and Stewart mm -hmm. and one... Do you have some sleepers that you think are really worth collecting in all of Canadian publishing. That, that's mm -hmm. number one, uh, some sleepers, some stock picks. And uh, number two, uh, you, you are a collector yourself, I, I assume. Yes. I wonder if you could uh, just talk about your passion for a, for a few minutes too. Let me go to my passion and then I'll talk about Canadiana. In the uh, late 70s, my major collecting was Stephen Leacock and that I've, I've done several books on Leacock and I collected Leacock in depth. And I did bring, bring those principles of collecting in terms of scarcity, condition, uh, everything to that. And I'd, it was a, a great collection that I put together. Uh, that's not with me anymore at Library Archives Canada. And I had a lot of fun with that. Would it be possible for someone to replicate that? Sure you can. It's not, is, it, is it that difficult for someone to do that? Do what you, you can did? replicate it. However, Sunshine Sketches of a Little Town in Dust Jacket, I've only seen the Dust Jacket for the American edition. You can replicate that to a great extent, although mm -hmm. I, it, it would take you many years. Sure. Plus, I collected all editions and all uh, reprintings of, of, of Lee Clock. Mm -hmm. uh, for Sunshine Sketches of Little Town, I had four shelves minimum, <laughs> right? I mean, I did. that's the type of thing. And again, you try to improve it all the time. A after that, in my own collecting right now, I've got about five or six sections. My major collection that I have is on antiquarian figure skating. My son was a figure skater, and I was determined after I got finished with Leacock and the collection wasn't with me anymore, that I was going to collect hockey, which was my big interest. But in point, point of fact, I found out that too many people are collecting hockey. Well, baseball is number one, golf is number two, cricket is number, maybe cricket is one or two, I don't know. Hockey is probably number four, but it's still very big time collecting. It's, it's not just collecting the books. When I say that I collect figure skating, I collect not just books, I collect all programs, photographs, postcards. And I concentrate on the pre-1960 period and with regard to post-1960 only if it's signed mm -hmm. by somebody. And mm -hmm. it's a very affordable area and I am very much into it. So I have that. I do collect Canadian uh, novels in dust jacket pre-1920. It's not a large collection. What's the goal there? Is to finish it up and then no, there is no finish. Hand it on. That won't be. Well, eventually, I'd like to uh, give it to the Canadian. Mm, I'd like to go somewhere. Go somewhere, but it's yeah. not just Canadian. It's it's. Uh, I do collect Canadian uh, programs and materials, mm -hmm. but it's uh, international. I have I don't know, four hundred postcards. Uh, anything and every everything. Where you would get them, obviously, is online, but also <laughs> paper show. Every every, every kind of In event any. or wherever. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thrift store everywhere. Yeah, so I I'm out there and I don't believe that many people collect in that area, and and in fact that's what I that's would always advice. say to to yeah. someone is don't collect 
what everybody else is collecting. So I collect that. I also collect, for example, Canadian. I have a collection of gray owl that's sort of da uh, dormant. He didn't produce a lot. I, I've got, I don't know, uh, say 600 items, m less than that. I do collect uh, Wilfred Grenfell because of his aerobic nature, uh, but that's more ephemera as well, although I collect him in jacket and signed copies. He's quite interesting. Uh, letters, things like that, if photographs come on the market, but now there are too many collectors in that area as well. There's sort of cause the Newfoundland sort of connection. Mm -hmm. I've got that. What else do I have? I do have a collection of uh, the Mosher Press that I desperately mm. love to get rid of because I find them too too prissy and finicky for my tastes. Mm. I've got several shells that I don't want the stuff. In connection with, with skating, I have a collection of, for example, of Hans Brinker and the Silver Skates. I have, I don't know, six shelves at least of Hans Brinker from the first edition going, of course it has a skating connection. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so <laughs> that's your uh, justification. Right? Yeah, to go to the Canadiana. Your stock picks. Anything that, that you think is undervalued or that, that has qualities worth admiring and having and owning? Okay. Well, there was a period, say 1990, where everything was overpriced in my opinion. The material prior to 1900 in Canadiana, what is usually called Canadiana, uh, historical materials, uh, voyages, uh, Moody or Strickland, material that appeared under a Niagara uh, imprint or a Kingston imprint or something like that, that stuff had big ticket prices on them and the institutions now have them and there st certainly are collectors that are out there. The pr but I do believe that the prices have come down for a lot of that for one reason and that's because of the internet, and all of a sudden the number of copies on the market. It's not so rare. Uh, yeah, but yeah. some things are still rare, particular types of imprints. Uh, like like graphic. Fine press, it could be, yeah. In yeah. Ottawa, the graphic. <coughs> well, graphic has always been uh, collectible. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it still is collectible, but especially if it's in Second. dust jacket. Graphic yeah. has a particular life from, what, 1925? The last book, in fact, is Leacock's edition of La Lafontaine's Voyages, 31, I think. That's a nice thing to collect because it's a finite number of books. Those books are very, very distinctive with, with that with Thunderbird in, imprint. Yeah. Very collectible. It used to be expensive books. Perhaps they've gone down a bit. So I think that's probably a good thing to collect. Any books that are, but by way of illustration from the 20s, I think is a good thing to, anything by McDonald, Thurl McDonald. But again, as soon as you get into Thurl McDonald and the McDonald's and that, because of the group of seven, uh, connection, connection yeah. uh, the prices are going to rise. But if you are going to do it, you better collect, again, all the time with jacket. In the I 20s? Yeah. Uh, any illustrators uh, that may not have that cachet but may have been just as good that come to uh, mind? Ryerson does some interesting books at this particular period of time. Lauren Pierce comes into mm. the company in 1920, and they don't have large print runs. Again, the question is, what are you collecting for? Most people are mm. collecting both from a, it's a, it's it's a mix mixture. Of, a lot of people certainly have their eye on the dollar, but in combination with that, they have to have their eye on condition, and is there a basis for that collecting? And um, is there a way of sort of deaccessioning it at yeah, the end? At uh, the end, know. but if one were uh, collecting a very, very popular author, you may find out that there's lots of them out there. It may look wonderful and quite lovely in jacket and everything, mm. and if you go to Abe, you'll, you'll find that there are multiple. What, the online books has done is that it has driven down the prices. First books of any author mm. are worth collecting. And any book that wins the Governor General's award or a major prize, worth collecting. You, you try to collect books that have some sort of importance. To a, to a certain extent, it is like the stock market. Mm -hmm. For example, I don't know if Morley Callahan is holding his own. Probably not. There's an association with Hemingway. Mm. Uh, his first few books, possibly, but they may he may come right back. Uh, I don't know. Richler for the 50s when he starts off, you know, probably will hold it his own. Atwood is going strong. Her first book, Double Persephone, uh, published by the Hawkshed Press, that book will never lose value. You can't go wrong with that. Similarly with Michael Ondaatje, his first books, poetry oh. books, they will never go down in value. But the um, English patient has well, taken a bit of a dip, hasn't it? That's because it's the print run. The print yeah. run of those are just so phenomenally high. But the early books with Coach House Press and so forth, I think they should be fine. Leonard Cohen, uh, it reached a peak, went down, probably will go back up.
I think that'll probably happen with most of the stuff that sort of s it flooded the market now yeah. because of the internet. But at some point, there'll be a, a, an yeah. evening up, and and what the truly important stuff will increase in value over time. Yeah. Let, let me give you an, an, an instance in my own case where yeah. I collected something, but I'm not really collecting. Lawrence Hill's The Book of Necros. This is a bestseller. It may become even more of a bestseller because there's a movie coming out. Mm -hmm. When his book came out, uh, it was a sen sensation. I read it, and it was truly extraordinary. I thought it was the best novel uh, in Canada, perhaps since Lawrence's the, the, the Diviners. I don't know. In my own particular instance, I collected proof copies, uh, and proof copies are always good, of any author. Advanced copies? Advanced copies. Yeah. And there are different types of these. There's some advanced reading copies, and there's, there are proofs, and they're different. Those are always good. Those are signed by Lawrence Seal, who in fact just lives a couple of few blocks from here. Huh. He lived in Toronto, but I had him sign those. And it won signed. the Commonwealth. Yeah. yeah, although he does sign a lot of books, and that is a major book, and who knows what will happen to it eventually. Right now, the signed copies of Dust Jacket go for about $200, right? You can buy them. But there aren't any proof copies for sale. In the case of Lawrence Hill, I just thought that was such an astonishing book. Mm. Now, it hasn't been fully appreciated in the United States where it has a different title, Someone Knows My Name. They didn't want to use the and word Negro, did they? Yeah, yeah, they didn't. The book is coming into a movie, these sort of things, and it's, it's a Canadian production. It may not succeed, who knows? But if it does... Mm. And the same, uh, the same way, for example, if one were to acquire uh, a proof signed copy of The Stone Angel or some of early uh, Lawrence's. Lawrence also has, uh, I think, reached a certain market, and she's not wholly international. Atwood is, is definitely international. Uh, Andachi is international. Lawrence Hill is he's international. So it's, it's the, those first books, definitely, of, of authors, especially when they take off. Leonard Cohen is always going to remain. Beautiful Losers, or you know, the, the first book of poetry uh, uh, published by McGill University Press in the 57 or so. There are a couple of other books in the 50s, poetry books, say, of Leighton, Dudek, and Souster, uh, associated with New Wave Canada before that. They're good collectible books. They did reach a peak. Maybe they've settled down now. That'll give you an idea. Yeah, no, that's good. I think one of the things that sticks with me is the mm -hmm. illustrated uh, editions with Dust Jacket uh, of any Canadian imprint in the 20s. Yeah, there's a good area of collecting. There was a renaissance in an interest in Canadian books. You mentioned graphic. That's the highlight of it. And, of course, it's a failed endeavor. It's the whole time in which people are asking, is there truly a distinctive Canadian literature? I mean, there always was, in the sense that the books published in Canada, and there was certain Canadian authors. Mm. But most of those authors, well, prior to 1950, they all had to go outside of Canada. Well, isn't it funny that a couple of them, it may have been Burton and Mowat, I think they came via an American agent. Burton did, in fact. Burton's first book on royalty, yeah, that was uh, published. Uh, and so was uh, Mowat's uh, first book published uh, in the States. But then, of course, they were found in Canada, and that's McClellan's genius. Great. Well, that gives us a lot to chew over and Good. to go out and hunt down. So thank you for your time. You're welcome. I've been speaking with Carl Spadoni, who is the director of archives and research collections at the McMaster University Library in Hamilton, Ontario, and the co-compiler of the McClellan and Stewart bibliography, published in 1994 by ECW Press. Very good. Thanks again. Yeah.